On July 4th, 2023, Holly Jenkins went for a stroll with her dog near the golf course on Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. Hours passed and she didn't return home. Worried, Holly's husband and son went out to look for her, finding only her lonely dog. Meanwhile, a massive alligator was dragging poor Holly into a nearby canal. However, are there any chances of survival after a water predator attack? Find out in this video, but remember, viewer discretion is advised. If you casually walk by some water, watch fish and feed ducks, I guess you're probably not in Florida. This Sunshine State is home to around 1,300,000 alligators, lurking in almost any deep puddle or even salty water. Hence, Florida witnesses the most attacks by these predators, while encounters with alligators mostly end peacefully, that's not always the case. Residents of Ford Pierce in Florida knew all too well that their lake harbored alligators. One of them, Henry, was so well known that he even had his own name. Locals spent years boating and strolling along the lake, seemingly unbothered. 85-year-old Gloria Serge, living nearby in a senior living facility, would regularly walk her dog Trooper by the lake. Unfortunately, on February 20th, 2023, Gloria's routine took a tragic turn. As she strolled along the shore, her dog sniffed the water, stopping at the lake's edge. Whether Gloria knew she was caught on surveillance cameras at that moment is unknown, but what she definitely didn't notice was Henry, the alligator, closing in. The next moment, the predator lunged out of the water, attacking Trooper. The scared dog managed to escape the alligator's teeth, but Gloria, trying to pull him away, fell. The predator grabbed her leg and dragged her into the lake. At the same time, another resident, Carol Thomas, witnessed Gloria fighting for her life against the massive alligator. Shocked, Carol immediately called the rescue service to report the predator attack. He pulled her in! He pulled her in the lake! However, within seconds of the call, horrified Carol screamed that it was all over. It's too late! It's too late! Oh my God! Did you pull her under? When the police arrived, it was too late to do anything. Still, they hoped to at least find Gloria's body and capture the human-eating alligator. The beast didn't yield easily, though, and refused to resurface. Specialists had to search the bottom, eventually pulling the alligator out despite its insane resistance. When they finally retrieved the beast, it turned out to be gigantic. About three meters long and weighing almost 320 kilograms, the elderly woman never stood a chance. Gloria Sergei's body was later found in the lake, and the killer alligator had to be euthanized. In less than six months in South Carolina, under similar circumstances, another alligator killed yet another woman, Holly Jenkins. The predator attacked her while she was walking her dog near the water. Perhaps in these cases, it was the pets that provoked the alligators. However, sometimes there's no clear reason for their attacks at all. A few months after those tragic events in Largo, Florida, a local guy, Jamarcus was heading for a job interview, feeling the jitters before the event. But when he reached the bridge over the irrigation canal, a creepy sight distracted him from his thoughts. There was an alligator in the water, holding the bottom part of a mannequin in its jaws. The guy was baffled that the predator found a human-sized doll and decided to munch on it. However, Jamarcus's gut told him to chuck a rock at the alligator, and he realized the horrifying truth. The pale figure in its teeth wasn't made of plastic. The man thought about the nearby school, realizing kids walked the same path he had just taken. So Jamarcus rushed to the fire station nearby and reported what he saw. Rescuers quickly arrived and confirmed there was a human body in the alligator's jaws. While experts wrestled the over four meter killer alligator out of the water, shock townsfolk tried to understand who its victim was. Once divers found human remains, doubts vanished. The predator murdered 41-year-old Sabrina Peckham. The police launched an investigation since it wasn't clear if the alligator attacked her while she was alive or found her already dead. Nevertheless, everything pointed to the fact that the beast indeed killed Sabrina. The woman was homeless, living in a camp near the irrigation canal. Moreover, just two months before the tragedy, she got arrested for trespassing into the waterlogged area just a kilometer from where her body was found. Some speculated that Sabrina might have teased the alligator or provoked it in some way. However, she left behind an adult daughter who vehemently denied such accusations. Grief-stricken Brianna Doris defended her late mother, asserting that as a Florida native, 
she knew well about the capabilities of alligators. Most likely, her mom returned to the camp late at night and couldn't spot the alligator. Additionally, Sabrina's daughter noticed no signs near the water warning about alligators, so her mom might not have known about the deadly threat. The reason for the predator's attack remained unknown. While most Florida residents might say alligators don't bother people unless provoked, Brianna Doris is convinced these are dangerous wild creatures. No one knows what's on their minds and what drives them, but if they get hungry, anyone in their path can become an innocent victim, just like her mother. Still, alligator attacks happen more likely somewhere near fresh water. When it comes to salty waters, another beast terrorizes them. In the summer of 2019, the Lindsay family from California willingly headed to a place teeming with the most dangerous sea predators. The family was on a dream vacation to the Bahamas. You most likely associate this place with luxurious relaxation, pristine beaches, and an incredible underwater world. Well, that's true, except among the colorful corals and fish, various types of sharks swim around. Tiger sharks, black tip sharks, lemon sharks, reef sharks, hammerheads, bull sharks, and about 40 more species. Moreover, in the Bahamas, there are several diving spots where tourists casually swim with these predators and even feed them. However, the Lindsay family opted for a less extreme swim, visiting the legendary Pig Beach. Along with six family members, a girlfriend of the older Lindsay daughter, Jordan, also joined the adventure. On the third day of the vacation, the seven American tourists impulsively hopped on a tour boat to Rose Island. It's almost 18 kilometers of white sandy beach on a narrow strip of land in the middle of the ocean. After lunch, the head of the family, Michael, with his two sons, younger daughter Madison, and Jordan's girlfriend, Jonna, swam on one side of the island with the famous swimming pigs. Jordan and her mother, Kami, decided to snorkel in another area. Around 2 p.m., Kami and Jordan were still exploring the corals when the mother heard her daughter calling for her. She turned around and saw her daughter surrounded by a pack of dolphins. Kami smiled, though only for a fleeting moment, as it suddenly dawned on her. Those were sharks. Jordan screamed briefly, and for a second, it seemed like nothing was happening. No one noticed the attack, and no one sounded the alarm. Only Kami Lindsay rushed as fast as possible toward her daughter. Approaching closer, the woman gasped. One of the predators had bitten Jordan's arm and sunk its teeth into her legs but the mother managed to hit the shark and free her daughter from its jaws. Kami grabbed the injured Jordan and looked around. There was no one nearby who could help, and Rose Island was too far away. So the mother found the nearest piece of land in sight and pulled her daughter toward it. However, it turned out to be incredibly challenging since Jordan could barely stay afloat. Unfortunately, it was just the beginning. Jordan shouted that yet another shark was approaching, the sea predator once again grabbed the girl by the leg and began pulling her underwater. Kami leaped onto the shark, striking it until it released the girl. And again, exerting titanic efforts, the woman dragged Jordan to the nearest beach. Meanwhile, the rest of the Lindsay family saw people around them getting agitated and gathering on another beach, watching something unfold. Then, someone said a shark had attacked a person. The family and Jordan's girlfriend were worried just like everyone else. Still, they had no clue who exactly had become the victim. From the shore, people saw Kami finally pulling her daughter out of the water. However, it brought no relief to the woman herself as she witnessed how severely Jordan was injured. The predators tore off one of her arms and bit practically her whole body. Despite the gruesome wounds, the girl was still alive. Shocked, Kami called for help. Unsure if anyone would even show up, time was ticking. Jordan was losing a lot of blood, and help was nowhere in sight. Finally, a boat appeared nearby, and employees from the tourist agency reached the woman. However, it turned out they had nothing with them to help the injured Jordan. They didn't even have a basic first aid kit. The only thing they did for the shark-bitten girl was wrap her leg with a towel. Kami was as shocked by this as she was by the predator attack itself. Every second was precious for Jordan, and she was losing blood drop by drop. They eventually transported the girl to the main island and, from there, to the hospital. Her horrified mother went along. Meanwhile, the rest of the tourists, including the Lindsay family, stayed on Rose Island, anxiously talking among themselves and sharing bits of information they overheard. Even Jordan's family wasn't informed that she was the victim of the attack. When this finally became clear, they rushed to the hospital as quickly as possible. There, 
They were met by devastated Kami with the tragic news. Jordan had died. Information about the student's death quickly made it to the global media, and the Lindsay family had to face new challenges. Some news outlets told heroic tales of Sandy Toe's employees bravely rushing to help Jordan. Yet, that wasn't the case. The close ones of the deceased girl decided not to tolerate lies and approached the media themselves to try and find who was responsible for this tragic death. The harsh reality was that none of the Sandy Toe's staff simply knew what to do in such a situation. Jordan's father emphasized that he wouldn't want anyone to go through the same tragedy as his daughter. So, he called for mandatory medical training for employees of tour companies conducting water excursions. His plea was supported by Dr. Eric Ritter, a biologist researcher, a diving pioneer with sharks, and a unique shark-human interaction specialist. Throughout his life, he researched the motives and reasons for shark attacks and created his own school, teaching divers, snorkelers, and divers how to interact with them correctly. The biologist also developed special courses and seminars for tourist companies to educate their staff on avoiding such catastrophes, like the one with Jordan Lindsay, and helping the victim in case of a shark attack. But Ritter also noted that the three sea predators that took the student's life behaved anomalously. Something provoked the sharks to attack, and what exactly remained a mystery. However, if there had been a first aid kit with the necessary supplies on the excursion boat, Jordan might have been saved. Because, as it turned out later, a doctor from Texas was traveling with the Lindsay family that day. She swam in the same spot where Jordan was attacked just a few minutes earlier. But the doctor didn't have tourniquets to stop the bleeding or try to save the young girl's life. Instead, she only took a photo of the sharks after the attack. Maybe there was one of those that attacked Jordan Lindsay. What if the predators truly had no other reason to harm the girl except for the animal instinct to kill? On December 8, 1963, 23-year-old Rodney Fox was defending his title as the spear fishing champion of Australia. Like everyone else, he was diving with just a mask and a snorkel, holding his breath. When he went underwater again, aiming his harpoon at a big catch, he suddenly felt a jolt. A hit with incredible force smashed into his chest. That was Fox's first thought. Whatever hit him was like a freaking train. Before he could fully grasp it, the impact was so powerful that it ripped the mask off his face and sent the harpoon flying from his hands. It propelled him through the water like he'd been shot from a cannon. And before he stopped, he realized two things. First, he was underwater. And there were no trains down there. Second, a massive great white shark attacked him. The next moment, the predator closed its jaws around Fox's body. The initial shock turned out to be a lifesaver for him because he hadn't felt pain yet and could figure out what he could do to save himself. The situation seemed hopeless, but Fox understood his hand was above the shark's head. So, as the shark dragged him down, he started hitting it, attempting to gouge the attacker's eyes. And for a moment, it worked as the fish paused. Fox instinctively used the pause to thrust his free hand forward to push the shark away. Instead, his palm slammed right onto the shark's teeth the moment it opened its jaws again. He got free from the death grip, but seriously injured his hand. Nevertheless, he managed to loop the shark around the waist to prevent it from biting him again, even though his right hand was practically non-functional. However, the man faced another serious problem, air. He was about 12 meters deep, having held his breath long before the attack. Now, he was running out of air. Again, survival instinct kicked in, and despite the pain and horror, Fox forced himself into action. He kicked his legs to push away from the beast and swam to the surface. Breaking free, he immediately took a deep breath and looked down. It was the most painful and terrifying moment of his life. Through the dark water, clouded by his own blood, he saw a giant shark emerging from the depths with its wide open jaws. Just like in the legendary horror film, Jaws, which would be released 12 years after Rodney Fox's shark encounter. If you found that movie scary, imagine what the fisherman who actually found himself in such a situation felt. The man decided to kick the shark in the face when it approached. However, water distorts perception, and Fox miscalculated the moment, barely touching the fish instead of hitting it hard. It was the end. Chances of survival vanished. Unexpectedly, a miracle saved him. The shark gulped down a buoy that Fox had been towing on a rope attached to his half-eaten catch. The predator realized something had gone wrong and decided to retreat. 
Yet when it dove deep, it pulled the rope with it, and on the other end was Rodney Fox. With no knife and both hands injured, he had zero chance of cutting the line. Still, Destiny smiled at the man again, and the shark decided to bite through the rope on its own. In a semi-conscious and disoriented state, Fox swam somewhere, not even realizing where the surface actually was. After a moment, Fox suddenly surfaced and could breathe. Then, he shouted at the top of his lungs, and the shark attacked him again. Other fishermen quickly launched a boat and headed toward Fox. They managed to pull him on board just before the shark returned to finish the job. That's when the man first felt waves of excruciating pain all over his body. Yet the realization of how close he was to death brought him no less suffering. The fishermen who saved Fox were utterly shocked by his condition. It turned out that the man's chest was pierced, and his lungs, diaphragm, spleen, stomach, and intestines were all injured. When, an hour after the attack, the pale and almost bloodless Rodney was brought to the hospital, he was conscious. Bewildered, doctors didn't know where to start. However, after four hours on the operating table, with 462 stitches on his body, Rodney Fox was moved to the intensive care unit. And he didn't just survive. The man recovered from horrendous injuries, shared his experience, and underwent psychological rehabilitation to return to the sea. Rodney Fox dedicated the rest of his long life to studying great white sharks, one of which almost killed him. He designed and built the first cage for underwater observation of marine predators and organized and led hundreds of research expeditions over 40 years. In 2023, he celebrated the 60th anniversary of his remarkable rescue. However, only a few lucky ones survived shark attacks to tell the tale. Among these fortunate individuals was underwater photographer Henry Borse, who not only repelled five predator attacks, but also captured one on video. Despite the horrifying nature of these events, the United States has only recorded about 45 fatal alligator attacks and 180 shark attacks in the last few centuries. Statistically, it's a minuscule figure, but we advise you not to neglect your own safety. You'd better subscribe to the channel and comment on which animal attacks you'd like me to include in the next video.